working great for me. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty much. The, oh, do you have a time limit that I need to keep an eye on or anything like that? Um, maybe like an hour. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely be around that for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we will uh, get started. All right. Well, awesome. welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, my man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll Appreciate get started the same place everybody else does. Um, let's kind of talk about childhood around to uh, middle school. Um, what were you into? Like, uh, what, what were you back then? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. If I can remember that <laughs> back. I mean, I'm only 29, so it wasn't that long ago. That's right. We're the same. Uh, we'll make it work. Yeah. You All can't right. tell. All right. cool. But if, if cool. I have a hat on, then maybe, <laughs> then maybe they won't be they won't uh, yeah, so growing up, it was I had a lot of energy growing mm. up. So my mom, to her credit, put me into a lot of classes. She didn't want me staying at home. Yeah, she. I, I mean, none of my siblings really stayed at home and did nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so she would put me through the full gamut of classes of extracurricular. So tennis, swimming, soccer, karate, then like um, like a, a Hindu, like a religion class kind of a thing okay um and then so that so all my days after school my time yeah. after school spent in one of those things and then uh what really stuck was probably tennis for sure okay and uh swimming to some degree but tennis i i, I played a lot of tennis growing up yeah um did so at what what age because tennis usually is definitely hard to get into at a later time yeah. well, at what age did you start I, playing tennis? I, would, I, I would say like six and and martial arts karate so oh, those cool. three things so yeah so i would say six i started i started tennis maybe when i was six and then karate when i was like i don't know eight i think i did okay. four years so wow. So yeah, so so those three things were where I spent a lot of my time yeah. after school, and then on the weekends we would do like family stuff. I didn't I didn't really like go out much. I didn't really yeah. like hang like hanging you out. Partying with too much as a middle schooler. No, like even in high school, <laughs> even in high school, I didn't really party until college. Yeah. Now that I think about it, like this whole idea of it's so stupid, but this whole idea of hanging out with people after school. Yeah, was so foreign to me mm -hmm. because I was just so used to going to classes. Right. So you so you had you had school then either right to tennis or right to whatever sport. Yeah, was some next. sort of and and I end on the weekends. So like yeah. my weekends were booked too. Absolutely. So of those three sports, did you like them all equally? What did you like the most? What was what was um, some of the highlights? I would say like I always had a I always had anxiety around like <clears throat> competition. Okay. Uh, growing up I think even now to some degree a little bit but um, tennis was always nerve-wracking to me because of that but then I got over it after a while mm -hmm. once I got older um, but I would say like I, I would say the the most long-lasting effect was martial arts because it taught me the really important ideals of like hard work discipline right humility integrity practice mm -hmm body movement like body awareness yeah and then um so that's kind of come that that's kind of lent itself to dance which is what i picked up when i was like 12 or 13 so that's so, awesome so, so dance became the next yeah iteration of like body uh sort of movement practice and absolutely and uh that became like my main source of i don't know obsession from That's 13 fantastic. onwards. So, so as far as like during karate and learning all these things, was it through just constant practice? Was it through the, would it be sensei or master or what was the? Yeah, that's a good question. It wasn't sensei. It was a Korean style. So Tung Soo Do was the name okay. of it. And uh, I think it was master. I think we called yeah. it really master. Mm -hmm. And so um, was it just going through the belts, learning everything slowly? What, what integrated that kind of thought process for you? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of like, um, so we had exams for every belt. Yeah. So there was, a, so there was like a curriculum for every belt. Okay. And, and so you would have to perform uh, whatever forms uh, that, that, that there were for each belt. And like there was no other way to learn it other than practice. Like you would learn it and then you yeah. would have to practice at home. Yeah. It, it, it was like choreography basically. Okay. It's like learning choreography. So 
there was no other way to really learn whatever it was without practice. And okay. If you wanted to do it at a high level and get like the the highest score. Yeah. You, and obviously coming from like immigrant parents, that getting the highest score is obviously very <laughs> important. Yeah. So so you know at home there was a lot like discipline was the word of of of, of the household. Okay. So yeah. other other than so obviously as 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 you make that comment there, um what in which ways is it showed that you need to get a high score you need to excel how is that more so expressed to you as as a child it was more like it wasn't like out of a negative thing it was just like you're capable of more you're capable of, like where okay. did you make the mistakes how can we improve and then how do we yeah you know not do that and, yeah. and also education in my household was held to a very high regard okay and, so and it was, was important to like do your best. Okay. And then once again, was it saying, Hey, you need to do this to get a good job, to get money or uh, uh, once again, how, how was it showed yeah. Is it by example or, or how did they kind yeah. of portray that? Yeah. It wasn't really about money. It was just about, it's the right thing to do, I suppose, because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was also like my parents took me back to India where they grew up, they took us all back. So we all knew where they came from and, and yeah. that lifestyle. And it's very, uh, it's a more complete 180 to Absolutely. where I grew up. I grew up in sort of privilege and they did not. So mm -hmm. for them, education was a big thing. And, and that was the sort of, that was one of the pillars of, I guess, having at least the tools to survive in a material sense and in a yeah. life sense once they are no longer able to pay for your lifestyle so mm -hmm. yeah i guess it was a survival thing it was an important uh it was like a badge of honor let's say for sure kind of thing you know education yeah. i think immigrants value education very much yes. because that's, that was their ticket to the american dream if you will mm -hmm. no absolutely um so growing up what was um what what, what did your uh diet and or nutrition look like was that something that oh, was focused it was on? all it was all uh no it's so funny like i i have a huge appetite all right and I, I have my i have my my mom's side of the family is known for eating okay not necessarily a bad thing eating is good no no it keeps no, us not alive. at all <laughs> but uh yeah that's very true but you know we like to indulge we like we like food i mm -hmm. love food so diet and nutrition is has was never part like it was just assumed that the home cooked food was the best food and it yeah. is very good mm -hmm. but if we're talking about real diet and nutrition like we're talking like athletic kind of stuff yeah then it's probably not the best because there's a lot of carbs in indian food and there's yeah. a lot of you know well and, and and I think a lot of people look at perfection and that's Arnold and then like he's definitely eating clean, but also he looks that he looks like that for a couple days a week or a couple yeah. days a year and then yeah. he's bulking for the rest yeah. of it. So that yeah, might not be the epitome yeah. of health. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. There's also like a, what I've noticed, there's a science to nutrition, which we don't, you know, we just eat. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the like, if you were to go to that level, it would have been very different. But yes, for us, yeah. it was just home cooked food. That mm -hmm. was a big thing. Um, our food is like, you know, there's a lot of vegetables, a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. Grew up eating a lot of fish, and um, but I ate a lot of junk food. Okay. I love chips. I love Doritos. Yeah. There's a cool, there's a fact. Cool ranch. A, cool ranch or I, Doritos. I, I like I like it all. I like Cool Ranch. <laughs> I like nacho i like spicy nacho okay i like i just finished a bag of chips over the weekend salsa verde there we go the spicy chili the purple okay. one yeah love that one yeah uh i love pizza mm -hmm. um so so i sort of i have a i guess an obsessive personality but i uh took it to another level as a kid but then mm -hmm as I grew up and started dancing and started taking it a little more seriously, then all that was cut out. For so, time. so do you think was, was it showing in sports? Like, were you struggling? Were you overweight? What oh, was... I was, I was, I was overweight as a kid. Okay. Um, for sure. 
like I was like thin mm-hmm. growing up, and then I don't know when I um, bulked up, if you will. Um, but it was definitely like, yeah, I think elementary school, middle school. Then when I started dancing at around 13, 12, 13, then I started losing it. And then there's the baby fat stuff. Yeah. Um, but I would say like, I don't know, I don't know, seven to 12, the diet was horrible. Yeah. A lot of chips. I played a lot of video games. So I played a lot. I ate a lot of chips. Wonderful. All right. So was it, uh, GameCube, Xbox, PS2, PlayStation. Uh, PlayStation. PlayStation and PlayStation 2. Okay. Very nice. Um, so yeah, as far as what did your parent did your parents, uh, when you're eating, did you ever get to say, no, I don't want this? What, what was their kind of, um, there was never a shortage of food. Okay. Um, for sure. It was always like, watch the, it was the junk food. That was the problem. But Mm -hmm. if I like ate my mom's food, it was never a problem. It was never a problem. Yeah. You know? So it was always the outside food. It was always the, it was those chips, it was those chips and ice cream. Ice cream yeah. sandwiches. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's hard because either the ice cream sandwich is so small you can't just have one, or it's big and then you don't want to just have just one. Yeah, the thing my mom would get is these snack, uh, these snack pack chips. Yeah. And it was like a row of 60. So it was like Fritos, Lay's, Doritos, and then whatever, uh, Cheetos. So yeah. and I knew where she hid them. So I so I knew. Yeah. So, and I knew that if I threw it out in the upstairs trash can, she would see it and she would catch me. So I threw it. So I, so I took, so this is what happened. I actually took the wrappers and we have a yeah. couch downstairs in the, in our basement yeah. where, where I would play. So I would actually throw the wrappers underneath the cushion of that sofa. And then so one when, day, when did that and, then, get clean? and then one day, my we're going out for dinner or whatever and for some reason my dad is like waiting downstairs and he takes a seat on that couch and as soon as he takes a seat on the couch he just hears this crunch sound of all the rappers and so he's like what the hell is that so he gets up he takes the cushions out and it's literally a montage like a paper mache covering of fritos lays cheetos doritos <laughs> like all these snack packs underneath the, the 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 cushion of the sofa so he was <laughs> i mean they laughed about it because it was so funny but yeah that's that's when i got caught yeah <laughs> that's I fantastic that. i remember that yeah so um as far as dance how was how was that introduced to you what what was kind of surrounding that yeah so we do this like family reunion uh, every couple of years it's like our community mm-hmm. our our uh, like where my parents have come from they came from a uh, <clears throat> a city uh, called Mangalore okay so, so we do so like a lot of them immigrated here to the U.S. so we do so they started like back in the 70s this huge reunion mm-hmm. across, across North America and then we all like congregate in one city and that city hosts it whatnot right so growing up my there, it's like a four day event. And like on the last okay. day, there's like a variety show and every, mm-hmm. every state has to kind of do a performance. And it's like very traditional for the kids to get involved and whatnot. So my older brother, my older sister went through the whole, you know, rite of passage of doing that, being forced to dance, blah, blah, blah. And then it was my turn. Yeah. And it was like 2000, 2003, I think think so i think 2003 that's when i like had to perform and that was when my number was called and, yeah and so i did it with all my cousins and whatnot and i saw the tape and i just really like it sucked and i for some reason it like bothered me that i was so <laughs> that it hit you deep <laughs> yeah i don't know why like it's not like dance was ever part of the conversation but yeah i just thought okay i'm gonna do this and the next time i perform whenever that is i'm gonna yeah. be better so I just started practicing every day after school, coming home, and then it that was like my training for two or three years, um, just popping in DVDs of uh, Indian movies, and then 
eventually my mom, again, to her credit, she noticed it and she was like, I'm going to put you in a class. Nice. And then, and then like, um, I think when I was 16, 15, 16, I, I started um, dancing at, at a studio and with a company and then sort of trained, I guess, quasi. And, That's super uh, cool. How, how was yeah. that? Oh, it was good. It was a great experience. It was, it was again, another extracurricular activity yep. on the weekends where like, oh, this whole hanging out with people thing just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So, so I had another outlet to have and I actually picked it in a way like mm-hmm. dance was something I chose to do. And so that's why I guess I stuck with it and it became a really interesting passion. And then that springboarded me into the acting world. Mm-hmm. off of dance which also was just another mistake but a happy one yeah and uh and so from like 16 to like 20 21 i was dancing with this uh with this company and we would do shows we would do like shows at sweet 16s we would do shows at like corporate events we would do big stage shows when like huge movie stars would come and like they would do shows so it was kind of like a yeah it was like so what kind of dance studio was it was it it was uh it was everything or it was uh it was a bollywood uh okay okay so um so yeah so so i was do i guess i was i don't know dancing semi-professional i call it semi-professional were you getting paid i I was getting paid oh that's pro a little bit that's pro um I would say the standards, I don't know. I don't know. Now that I see, like, when I see professional dancers, I'm like, they're, like, trained. They're, like, there's yeah. a proper training behind what they did. We were just, or I was just kind of, like, putting things together. Yeah. So what, what, what was practice, like, from when you first started showing up? Do they just give you the moves and you just have to learn them? Or, what, um, like, walk me through a couple of practices? Yeah, I mean, we would get a gig and, and we would have like set numbers. Eventually it got to a point where it was like, we would have preset uh, songs okay. and, and we would have routines to them. And then we would have little like, um, little things that we would have to change, maybe the Freaks order of the stuff. Yeah. yeah, but we would usually learn a new piece or or there would just be one gig where we'd have to learn like, five different pieces mm-hmm. and so every practice was just learning and we would have the, the, the sort of the head of the um the head choreographer he would sort of choreograph all the pieces and then yeah. maybe we would have inputs after a while or something or he would be like you know you do this solo here so you make it up and whatever mm-hmm. or it, it was it was very uh it's really it's like sort of like guerrilla style filmmaking if you will it was, it was okay. very like it was very like there's no method here, but there's, it's interesting. Yeah. And people keep hiring us. <laughs> and, and it was working. Here. It was working. And that's also kind of like what Bollywood dance is, is like, there is to some degree, some technique and some, yeah. um, um, I don't know, um, like uh, history and whatnot, but there's also just a lot of acting. There's a lot of like simple movements and yeah. It's really the the show and the entertainment value. It's not mm-hmm. so much choreography driven. Yeah, I think it's more of an act. It's like a it's like a musical act. Okay, if you will. So you have to like lip sync. You have to like act. You have to tell a story. So that's really what it became more about. Okay. And so that's kind of like where I got my first acting training, I suppose. But yeah. But that's what it was. That's that it was a really interesting um, guerrilla style dance, I suppose. What what was it like on some of the bigger stages? Did you ever have stage fright? What did you meet any of the famous people or what was some of those scenarios? I mean, those those bigger gigs were not they were okay. I mean, it's cool to be on a stage with like I don't know, ten thousand people, but Wow, where was that? Uh, I think we did one in Atlantic City. We did one in, um, I don't know if it's still up, but NASA Coliseum in Long Island in uh, where the where the Islanders play. Super cool. Yeah, it was cool, but it's just like, I don't think I ever enjoyed being a backup dancer. <laughs> hey, be true to yourself. I, That's good. Yeah, I just, 
the, the the smaller intimate gigs of like sweet 16s or somebody's party yeah and where there's a dance floor and then you're just surrounded by people that was more interesting because it, it was it's a smaller it, it's not like 30 dancers it's just like our troop mm-hmm. which could be eight people four people and each of us would have our own numbers to okay. lead yeah. And so we were, there, there was a way, there's an intimacy to that that makes it sometimes more enjoyable because you can actually, in a way, interact with the people that are watching you and they feed you and you feed them. When yeah. it's so big and you're just a prop on stage, so to speak, it's, Got it. it's, it's a very odd, but I also haven't had enough experience on that kind of a big stage. But yeah, from what I remember, it was just, it, it, you, you feel... It's a weird thing. It, it, you don't really feel seen in a way. And you don't, it's a weird thing. Like, cause there's, there's this distance between you and the audience on yeah. a big stage like that. Yeah. Like you're there, but you don't know that. They there's know all, that there's all this <laughs> rail. There, yeah. There's all this railing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's kind of in a way removed mm-hmm. from the audience. So you don't get that intimate um, back and forth, if you will, but. And also as a backup dancer, nobody's really, I don't know. The light's not just on you. <laughs> yeah. So was there, um, as far as being a backup dancer, were there any like, uh, I don't know, were there battles for first? I, like, how does that, how does that even, how does that work? No, it was, it was more like, this is your job. This okay. is the routine um we hire you as shooting guards and we want you to shoot we don't need yeah to yeah, yeah. Like you, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah like you have a you have a role to play okay um and then some of the dancers who maybe were around for longer or like just better dancers maybe would get a chance to dance with the star okay um, and like next to them and whatnot and interact yeah. and whatever but um it was very much like you're a backup dancer. This is the star. Mm-hmm. You, you don't, there's no interaction. Yeah. You're the don't scenery. talk to them. Yeah. 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 Don't talk to them. To, which I kind of hate it. It's kind of stupid. I think. Yeah. I, they're, they're people too. <laughs> we should be able to say hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. So, so I, I, I knew like I never wanted to become a professional dancer, Okay. but it was, it was a great experience and it was a great um, introduction to Yeah. So when, exactly. when you were traveling, did you hang out with the people? Like when you were traveling for work and stuff like that? Did you, um, did you dabble in hanging out? So like when we did those bigger shows, uh, where it was like maybe 30, 40 dancers, it was, it was, it was, yeah, we, we hung out. Like the dancers hang out. Right. Then the stars are kind of on their own. But when we would do like these more intimate shows and it was just eight of us or six of us mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun because that troop became right sort of familial and we would we would hang out outside of um outside of uh gigs and stuff like that like that was a lot of fun i had a mm-hmm. lot of fun with, with that smaller troop that we yeah. had for those three four years um yeah and that that was a, that became very enjoyable after a while yeah. So, and that was up until what age did you, did you have that gig? I think I really just stopped. I was, I was like very in it maybe from 16 to like 18, 19. Okay. And then come college, I think mm-hmm. kind of died off a little bit and then I would kind of sporadically go back, but uh, I, I didn't move. Uh, yeah. I think by like 23, 24, I was out. Okay. And I, I wasn't dancing with them. I was just dancing on my, now I just do it on my own and yeah. just for myself, it's just my own thing. Yeah. So uh, as far as uh, like high school goes, was there a certain uh, degree you're looking for a certain job that uh, for looking at school was somebody helping you towards a direction? What did that look like for you? Yeah. My parents never really pressured me to do anything. I think more of the pressure came from actual high school and guidance counselors Okay. of like, you know, what college are you going to? You need to have these top three and then this backup and you need to have blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I've never really talked to my guidance counselor. And then now all of a sudden they're like- Now, now he's my guy. <laughs> yeah, now he's now, well, actually that's not true, but my guidance counselor changed. I don't know, I don't know. 
but but it was just weird that I had to have all this stuff figured out in a way. And uh, I don't know, my parents never really bugged me about it, which is interesting. I had always had my mindset on doing dentistry. Okay. But at that age, it was like, either you go into some kind of science or you yeah. do... So did did you really yes. did you really like your childhood dentist? What was the? <laughs> it was he, to he me. I was bubble gum flavor. What was yeah, the? <laughs> I don't know. It was it was like to me there were two there like in my mind there were two options which was science or business or like corporate yeah. whatever. And I was good at science. I was good at biology. Okay. And so I figured I'd go down the road of some type of medicine. Mm -hmm. And people were always talking about how. And now I realize how ridiculous this is, but like to some degree, dentistry is like less hectic than medicine mm -hmm. and is a little easier, which is, I have friends that are in the dental game. And it's like, dude, no, it's not. It's, like, yeah. it's, it's, it's expensive. It's just as competitive. It's just as crazy. Yeah. And, um, and so that, that's what I chose. Uh, I figured I'd do something in science and medicine related. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that all got flipped on his head when I did my first film at 18. And you know, that was really what I should have done. I should have just gone down the road of acting anyways, because everybody else was like, you're not going to become an actor. You're not going to like pursue the arts in some way. <laughs> when, no, when everyone was talking about it, you're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there, there, because I was like more practical in the sense, like there's no, there's no safety in it, yeah. but that's yeah. all, it's all. It's all nonsense to some degree. There's no safety in any of it. And yeah. if you just do what you are really passionate about and you understand, I think if you understand the skills of business, then you can take anything and make money off of it. Yeah. And unfortunately, I was never, I never learned the skills of, of marketing, selling. Yeah. Social media was very young at that point. Yeah. So um, it, w when you talk about business and stuff of that nature, did you, ever come across a class that was um extremely beneficial in that area because i remember having a marketing class and it was actually really funny um because the senor el presidente right now <laughs> they would show his show every wednesday and yeah. it was location 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 yeah so and just i would listen to him every wednesday talk to spew whatever his stuff was um but marketing wise like some of the stuff was interesting uh, catchy where's the default all that kind of stuff but um, yeah. I feel like not a huge amount was practical and once again it was a high school class but was there anything that resonated with you business-wise or accounting or anything like that I will say like in college ironically I went to Pace University to study acting dropped out of the acting program studied acting with a teacher outside of college okay. and in college I decided to switch my major to economics Mm -hmm. and I loved economics. And that's when I started understanding. Like, I, I feel like I got more worldly, like there's this world out there and everything is interconnected. And, and there's this thing called money. There's this thing called markets. There's this thing called people and behavior and supply and demand. Like, that's when I started understanding that kind of stuff. Now, they didn't teach me about investing and business mm -hmm. per se. But it, it, I think it planted the seed of like, I can, I can use this somehow in the, in, in my career as an actor. Okay. So when, so 18, what was the film? Like what, how did you get into it or what was? Yeah. So it came about through dance. Okay. Um, and the film is called When Harry Tries to Marry. Okay. It's a romantic comedy that you can find on, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Ooh, there we go. I feel like a lot yeah. of people have that. I think so, yeah, I, I, yeah, it is. Um, so that was uh, that was my first foray. But that I got because I was dancing and a director yeah. was at the show and he saw me perform and was like, you know, I'm writing this film and would you like to audition for it? And I was like, yeah, sure. I, I had no, uh, acting was never sure. part of my thing, so auditioned it was terrible and then somehow i got a call back 
<laughs> we well, so what was so terrible about the audition? Did did they give you a script beforehand? What 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 was? Yeah, the like I I had come I had prepared stuff okay. like uh, they gave me the the script or uh, some pages, and they had me prepare a couple of scenes. So I did, and I did it to whatever I, you know, the best yeah. of my knowledge without mm -hmm. having any. Do you feel training. like your dancing? kind of helped because you said that was a little bit of acting as well yeah that, that was the only training i really had and, mm -hmm. and then the discipline from martial arts of like you just have to do it yeah you know that like i don't know but we just have to do it yeah so as, as far as that discipline goes i think a lot of people are uh, have a hard time wrapping the head around discipline and what i imagine going on in your head when you are kind of talking to yourself about something, there's the just do it also because you believe and you know that, oh, I'm just gonna have to keep doing this and I'm gonna see the end result. When yeah. I think a lot of people, when they tell themselves like, oh, I just need to be more disciplined, but they have no reason to believe in themselves for whatever that reason is. So that discipline yeah. is kind of short-sighted. So they're like, I just need to kind of do it kind of thing. Yeah, discipline is also, uh, from what I've learned, at least from this year, mm -hmm. discipline has nothing. It's it's non-emotional. Mm -hmm. It's not attached to. It's 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 not about your feelings. Yeah. It's about your sense of responsibility, if you will. So, discipline is about doing what you know you're responsible to do, which you can arbitrarily put on yourself. Like, right. I want to get into shape. Okay, so now that's a commitment. Mm -hmm. And you are responsible to fulfill that commitment on the daily. Mm -hmm. And it's not about how you feel. It's just about doing what you know you're supposed to do to get uh, perhaps the end result or whatever. It's just that is your responsibility. So I suppose like with the acting stuff and like that first audition, it's just this is what I've got. It's my responsibility, if you will, to do this to the best of my ability for yeah. whatever reason, because I don't want to disappoint this other person. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to look back and feel like, ah, I, I, you know, I threw away an opportunity. Right. Came to me by some sheer luck. Mm -hmm. So, so I prepared as much as I could and then did the audition and it was great. It was, it, I mean, it was what it was. And then I just felt terrible afterwards. So I went for a walk. In this, it was in New York City, so I just went for a walk in the city, mm -hmm. and uh, my mom sort of chaperoned me, but she didn't really. She was like a pizza shop or something. Yeah. And then I just called her, and then then we went back home, and then I just forgot about it, and then like a couple of weeks later, I get another audition, and that one went better. I felt yeah. a little more comfortable, and then was it for the same part? So like it was a callback. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I read for like the title character. So that was really weird, you know, That's like cool. no experience, no nothing and reading for that. And then, yeah. uh, but the second audition, which lasts, it was just like a table read and mm -hmm. meeting people in and out, in and out. And, um, you know, it, it, it lasted for about, I don't know, three, four hours from what I remember. And wow. Yeah. By the end of it, uh, he offered me the part and then we, we had to raise the money, so we raised the money, and then we eventually shot the film. And so, how does how does that work? So he says, "Hey, you got the job. Now, can you bring in some money for us?" Or no, no. Well, it, 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 so he gave me the part, but it, they were still trying to figure out the financing. Okay. So what we had to do was we had to. They brought in investors, and we just did a whole sort of. We did it almost as like a play. Got it. Pitched like them. Yeah. yeah. We did the whole thing and we did it around for like three, four rounds. Wow. Of, of this kind of stuff. And, and um, they raised the money. And, and so then I think fall of 2008, no, fall of 2009, we shot it. That's super cool. What, what was the shooting schedule like? Was it kind of what you hear or, or was it decent on the, on the day? Uh, we, we shot, I think, 30 days in New York. And okay. then we, we went to India for like a 10 day shoot. What was that like? That was incredible. That, it was weird. It was interesting because I think I got spoiled on my very first film with all this happening. 
I, and and I was so new to it, so I figured this is just what it is. This is what it is, and I didn't understand like not all movies that get made get seen. Okay. So now that was the next part of the whole project, yeah. but yeah. doing it and like getting paid to do it, and then traveling and whatnot, and it was like. Oh, this is really cool. Okay, this is probably how it always is. But then, yeah. you were no, you were not. the you were the guy on the front of the stage. I was the guy in the front of the stage, and uh, and that was a really int- that was like purely learning on the job, and mm-hmm. that was uh, yeah. I've never felt so on the daily just defeated, and felt like what am I doing? I like really I've never felt so wobbly on my feet. Mm-hmm. I think that was the first time in my life that I'd ever experienced that level of perceived pressure and like just not feeling sure of anything that I was doing. It was mm-hmm. as if I'm just wandering. So e- even though you have the lead role, you're being brought around at top top of the line service and all that stuff going on. What 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 was the was it something somebody said or it was just a perception or? Yeah, I just felt like I, I didn't know what I was doing, yeah. you know? And so like all these other people are so experienced. Right. The camera people, the other actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, am I doing this? I don't even know if I'm doing this right. I don't know. It, I was always like being too big it felt like it was being too much or yeah and uh you know it's like you you kind of take everything you don't you don't understand um how do i say it? like when you're first starting you kind of take everything personally if you will yeah you, you, and it's not personal but you take it like oh i'm inadequate i'm inadequate so as in when the producer would say hey change this or the director yeah or like the okay. director would say like do this or the camera guy would be like do this this is too much that blah 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 that, or or something like that or it's just like this awkward energy and it's like i don't know what i'm doing you tell me what to do i don't know you told me to do that okay let's try that or like you try something and it's like no don't do that don't do that like i wasn't used to like pitching ideas and getting them rejected right and, and being kind of like yeah, it's just part of it. I don't care. Yeah. I, 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 you know, you're so green that it's like, for sure you get a little scared to, or some people do. I mean, I did. I was just yeah. scared to just try stuff or do stuff, but yeah. But then, you know, you've, I, I was eventually able to just get through it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I would say I learned a ton and it gives, again, like you go through those kinds of challenges. It gives you a ton of confidence on the, on the way out. Mm-hmm. And after that, then things got a little easier in terms of having my feet under me. Okay. So what, what was kind of, what was the rat party? Like, what was kind of the next steps going from there? I mean, I was, I was super young. So I I was, I was, uh, I was 18. So I couldn't drink, couldn't like do any of that. And that was also a foreign world to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Drinking. I never drank. Um, partying again i don't know yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know what it's yeah i don't know what hanging out with people means it doesn't I mean, make sense i'll probably tell this story a lot but i don't i don't drink much either but growing up um i always thought like oh i'm not gonna drink because i want to excel in sports but i was on like the b and c team so at that point uh, it didn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah and i was also very um very naive in some ways like I didn't have any experience I didn't Mm -hmm. have any real world experience to kind of use to interact with the environment that I was now in so Mm -hmm. it felt kind of I it I always felt uncomfortable I always felt out of place for me I yeah I just it just felt odd yet yet I just kept going so yeah after doing that film, I had to go back to college. Okay. So, so what was like the film finishes? Are you like, Hey, this is just what I'm going to do now. Or you're like, that was nice college. Yeah. So, so again, like education was big and I had to go to college because that was just the requirement Mm -hmm. in my family, I suppose. Um, And I was supposed to go to NYU for dentistry. Okay. But that 
fell off because I did the film. Mm-hmm. And that's NYU, very competitive. Yeah. And NYU is very um, weird and like they didn't, they wouldn't let me start in the spring. Okay. So I had to drop out and then I applied to Pace University, mm-hmm. which I got into because one of the actors on the film was the, um, he was an acting teacher at the, at the university. So he gave me Wonderful. a spot. Yeah. So he gave me a spot in the program and then, uh, and then I dropped out of the program. And then, so what uh, was the reason behind that? Yeah, so I, I so I had uh, started um, taking classes after that film, basically, and working one on one with a coach, um, who was probably the most influential, I think, person in my acting career to this day. Yeah, because he made the whole thing about me. Okay. Not in not in like an arrogant, selfish way. It was like, yeah, do like do the stuff that makes you scared. Also, just take your time. That that was a big thing. Like he just said, let's start slow. There's no need to rush. There's no need to like, no. Let's take it slow. Let's take the words off the page, and then we'll see. Let, like let's see what happens to you because of the words. Right. And let them affect you and then you go. And mm-hmm. then, you know what I mean? So there's this, then it just became really interesting. And it, 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 he basically allowed me to use my instinct. Okay. And that's a very tough thing, I think, to, to, to allow people. Um, and, and that's basically how I like to work is, again, there's no methodology, if you will, but there is a methodology in that, it's not entirely chaotic, but it's, it's coming from a more personal place. So even with dance, it wasn't, I wasn't technically sound. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not tech, I don't know the technique of dance, but I understand rhythm. Yeah. And I, I feel, I can feel music, if you will, in a way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean I'm very good. It's just like there is an instinctual yeah. aspect that if you develop first and then you have the technique, then things can be, ve- because then you can just unload in a scene. You can do things that surprise you and mm-hmm. surprise the people in the scene. And that makes you, and he taught me one very thing, very important. He's like, don't worry about being good or bad. Just worry about being interesting. And the stuff that's going to be interesting is the stuff that fires from your instinct, that fires yeah. from you, that fires from your willingness to take those chances to do the stuff that scares you Mm -hmm. and so he he kind of turned the the whole acting game and shifted it towards me towards myself and he allowed me to develop myself first before trying to quote unquote play a character or play this other he Uh, he made it about let's figure you out yeah I want to see you in this. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we have to honor the story and all that. But what's going to make your version of this thing of Hamlet or of Romeo or of, mm-hmm. of Biff or Happy from from uh, Death of a Salesman? Uh, it's going to be you essentially, right? So he planted that seed into my head at a very early age, and. I resonated with that. That that was like my free, I don't know. I understood that frequency of communication. So when he says, go after the things that you're scared of, is that something, a line that you had to go deeper in? You had to reach within? What is, what what, what does that look like? It's really like, it happens in a moment. Like you have this instinct to like, I don't know, yell a a part of the line or- Or, or, or do something weird with your body. And he's like, do it, get it out, get it out so Mm -hmm. that we can see if it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. He he basically was like fail. Okay. And he pushed failure. He pushed, Mm -hmm. he didn't push logic. He didn't ask me like, why did you do that? He would ask me more like, he, all he would say is like, just don't act, just, just, just be. 
yeah. just, just just do the thing and see where it takes you but just one thing don't like act don't act it the way you think it should be yeah do it the way that it's hitting you inside so he he, he made me more conscious of that okay uh, which i think pays dividends but the fear comes from that voice that you have which is either born out of some form of insecurity or instinct or impulse or whatever but he's like just get it out yeah and then we'll see if it if it leads you to something else if it doesn't if it if it's just completely like that makes no sense mm -hmm. but he's like get the stuff out so that you can see what is working what mm -hmm. keeps coming back what doesn't and and that way every single time you're in it things can start percolating and you can just go 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 without thinking too much about am i doing this right right I like it's, that. A so, it's a weird yeah it's a weird and and he had like a practical way of doing it and it was very simple just like look down look up whatever words you just captured from your brain and, and like whatever they do just say it that way yeah so if it makes you laugh laugh and nobody was communicating acting to me in that way mm -hmm. in the program so i just felt like i should stick to the guy that I resonate with and we'll figure something else out for college and yeah. ended up being the right decision for me. Then I'm not saying technique doesn't matter, but I think that it's like, you got to find your voice. It's like when you're podcasting, you got to find mm -hmm. your voice. Right. And to find your voice means you have to fail and you have to try stuff mm -hmm. and you have to re. It doesn't mean you have to be like, it's not, it's not technique per se. It's just, where am I? Who am I? Yeah. What do I have to say? What, what are my opinions on this thing? What do I, like, what am I? Who am mm -hmm. I? It, it's, it's sort of like more deep and there's no, you never get the answer because it's a, it's a ever evolving thing. Mm -hmm. But if you center around those kinds of questions, it makes you as a person much more engaging. And then whatever comes out of your mouth, and whatever medium becomes more interesting and more engaging because it's rooted in you. Right. And it becomes more quote unquote authentic and vulnerable and blah, blah, blah. But it's really just you. Right. So even when you start putting on weird costumes and you start playing characters that are more extreme and whatever, there's still this rootedness to the earth that people buy into Mm -hmm. and makes it relatable if you will because it's it's you've developed you you're developing right. you and you're exploring yourself through all these weird extremes and whatnot yeah there's probably a more eloquent way of saying it but you know no, I, mean? I like it it's, i like it <laughs> it's it's a weird it's a it's a different i think it's a different way to practice and i think it has a lot of benefits but Again, I think everybody operates on their own wavelength, and, and, mm. and this was just a wavelength that I understood. It was more, and and he was he was there for it. That's what it it was much more um, energy. Like it was like it was these weird words that I just understood. Yeah, and somebody who's maybe more type A won't. Mm -hmm. So he was. So he's taking you through the steps and whatnot. What where where are we going from? dropping out of school to that program, to having this coach, were you seeing him every day? Were you seeing him once a week? Like uh, what, just, what were you we, doing? I, I was seeing him once a week and then I was in college and then eventually I picked up economics in college and then graduated okay. with an econ degree, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And that was another, to me, that was another training in acting because it was another, it was another way to see people. It yeah. was another way to understand human behavior. Um, apart from just the actual technical stuff that we learned, but right. um, to me, that was another form of acting training. And, mm -hmm. and, and then, so after I graduated college in 2013, then I spent a couple of years in New York pursuing acting, living at home, pursuing acting, yeah. did, did some plays, did some indie, uh, did, uh, yeah, did some indie features, um, and uh, did some short, like did whatever I could get. Right. So, so you mentioned that everything wasn't as 
uh, high class as the first film you did. What 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 did the what did everything else provide to you? It just showed me. Again, it, it, like I think the best way I learn is learning by doing. Mm-hmm. That's how I prefer to learn. I don't, I'm not a good planner, if you will. I'm not yeah. a good like. I'm the worst at answering what's your five year plan. I'm yeah. the worst at answering like what's the next step. I'm the worst at like structuring things. I'm more like I figure out the structure by doing things. Mm-hmm. So the subsequent projects that I did, I did to learn that, to learn, you know, what, what is, what, like, like the second film I did was so torturous in a way because of how it was, it was just like very poorly planned. And, and then I, I just did a bunch of gigs that like, just to get that experience, right? just to figure out again, finding my own voice, mm-hmm. working with different people. Can I, can I still, um, implement what I'm learning and, 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 and then learn on the job and learn about being on set and, and working with people and traveling and, and, uh, working for no money, basically like $0 working for free. Do I like, I still have this, I like, again, I don't, I don't work harder when the paycheck goes up and I don't work less hard when the paycheck goes down. Mm -hmm. But to me, I'm understanding I'm in it for the pure passion, but like the obsession of getting better. Yeah. That's what actually drives me. The money is a byproduct, fame, byproduct, TikTok, byproduct, all of this mm-hmm. is a byproduct of just one thing, obsessive goal of getting better. So, yeah. So I was just like, I was just like, I was just doing everything and anything basically for free for years. Mm hmm. So, and, and by able to, so living at home, did you, were you working at a restaurant? Were you doing anything else for supplements? No, I mean like for a long, no, I was dancing. I was still dancing. Okay. Got it. So I think I was still making some income that way. And uh, yeah, my, I mean, my parents to their credit just like helped me out a ton and yeah. were like, just go, 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 go. We'll, 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 you know, we'll That's help wonderful. you out. Yeah. So I, I come from a very privileged uh, background in that way and, and mm-hmm. uh, very supportive. My parents are very forward thinking for their, yeah. definitely for their generation, but just in general, um, because nobody in their, in their position would ever push their kids. And even, I don't think support their kids as much as they have me in the arts. Right. So my, I am really a testament of their uh, commitment to my career and you know i like yeah it's 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 unfortunate not everybody has parents like i do you know yeah for sure because a, a lot of things could be very different yeah and so in in that regards it was pretty much hey mom i'm going to do this did they ever be like hey can you walk me through this or it was just they saw that it was your passion and that that's what you were i mean ironically they were the ones who kind of encouraged me to pursue acting wonderful like in 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 college and high school they were like you know you should do a play you should do and i was just too nervous but then because of the film it fell into my lap and then after that it's like i'm gonna do this and um i think they had their i think they still have their doubts they still have their worries Mm -hmm. 11 10 years later um and it's all going to be centered around, I think, one thing, which is money. It's always mm-hmm. going to be centered around money as in, like, can you actually just pay your own bills? And, right. And that's still, it's always, it's still a challenge. Mm-hmm. And it's always going to be a challenge because you work freelance. But this is where those business skills really can come into play. And, Absolutely. And that's what I'm learning now, 11 years later, seven, <laughs> you know, whatever. But it's, it's. It, it's like all these different pieces that I was introduced to at different parts of my life. Mm-hmm. I'm now understanding how to put them together. Yeah. So, so, so what are, what are some of those pieces that you saw back then? And you're like, Oh, this is actually something that I can do or something. Yeah. So, so I think economics put in the idea of like money and business kind of stuff. And then, mm-hmm. I just took an amazing course on, on, on learning about how to make money online and, and 
they talked about marketing and selling and just that that language and and those skills and um, the importance of like email lists and yeah. and sales funnels and how to give more bang for the buck as opposed to like how do I reduce my price because there's no actual point in being the lowest price in town so mm -hmm. I mean the second lowest price in town so you go the other way you give mm -hmm. more bang for the buck you give more value to right consumers so that way they'll be willing to pay actually more a higher price for the same product that they can get at another retailer because they're getting more value from you mm -hmm. so these kinds of concepts really important and then financial literacy like like taking the seed of economics and then nourishing it into this plant of financial literacy and getting those books mm -hmm. and understanding the importance of making money work for me like investing my money Mm -hmm. And learning how to invest it. What are stocks? What is a stock market? What are index funds? Yeah. What's crypto? What is real estate? The tax system. Oh, you need to become a business owner now. Okay. Yeah. All of these things. I would say like the last two years, 2019, 2020, the investment that I've made in terms of financial literacy or self-education financial right. literacy. And then I would say maybe business or entrepreneurship kind of skills. Mm -hmm that I can see how I, I can see it already paying dividends, but I can already see the positive spillover over effects that it will have in my career as an actor, because again, it's a business. Right. So now it becomes how do I take all these concepts and combine it with the creative, uh, uh, the creative endeavors that I want to do. So now, mm -hmm. you know, again, the financial literacy business stuff taught me the ownership mentality. Right. Which owners own, which obviously sounds obvious, but there, there's a lot that comes with that, yeah. which is responsibility, which is discipline, which is mm -hmm. uh, leadership, which is accountability. All these things are basically what I learned back in the day, like from, uh, from martial arts, from tennis, from being in that discipline week in, week out of doing what I know I'm mm -hmm. supposed to do even though I don't like it, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy martial arts. I don't enjoy karate, Yeah. but I got to do it because my mom is forcing me to do it or whatever. But just this idea, idea of like, I have to do it. I just have, there's no other choice. Mm -hmm. and that mentality is somewhat good. If you can direct it in, this, in the right way as yeah. well, towards what you really are passionate about. So all these things, now that I think about it, it's all coming together and it, you know, again, it makes me very, very optimistic about my future. And, 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 and then it, re it, it, it creates this positive feedback loop where I'm the owner. So whatever I think, and if I do it and put it into action, I can make happen. Right. So now it becomes, what do I want? What do I want to do? Oh, I want to mm -hmm. do that. Okay. So then that, and then that, then that. I want an Oscar. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do, but it's a long-term investment. Okay. Right. It's 30 years down the road. Maybe it's 20 years down the road whatever we'll commit it's process 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 that's what i'm realizing is that yeah process is the only thing that really matters and if you can tie yourself to process mm -hmm. the results are secondary they're important but the process is is it has to take primary focus because that's the only way you get better and if you get better and you start adding skills that maybe you have judgment about business mm -hmm. money you add that to the stuff that you're naturally passionate about because you have the discipline and self-awareness to do it and you just force yourself to do it. Yeah. Now you can add more value to whatever line of work you're in, mm -hmm. which then improves your probability of success within the thing that you're after. Yeah. And I, I like to tell people a lot, like most things that we want to do, someone has probably done it before us. So there's, there's a framework on how to get that done. There's someone yes. we can learn with. We have abundance yes. amount of information. So um, yes. what, what was it in 2019 that got you started on this financial literacy? Was it somebody, was it a friend? What, what, what? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, there was a couple of years before leading up to it. Like I'd always, it was really after college that I realized, oh, I have this money in my savings account. I want to do something with it. So that's when I really started self-educating. Okay. And it took me some time, it took me like, well, I mean, like four or five years to find the right books. And, and I was kind of sporadically doing it too. Yeah. 
but it was really something happened. Something clicked in 2019 where I just went book after book, like one book led me to another book, which led me to another book, mm-hmm. which led me to another book. And then I think I just started getting a little more savvy with how I was using um, uh, social media, in particular YouTube. Okay. And I was inputting into YouTube how to invest. Uh, Tony Robbins, uh, this person, that person, this person. So then that led me to their books and their information. And right. those books led me to this. So it was really about, I have access to the information. Mm-hmm. I, have, I have these tools at my disposal, but how am I using them? Right. Which I think is a huge thing about social media is that it's an amazing tool. Yeah. If you don't use it with the right self-awareness and discipline, Mm-hmm. then it can really hurt you. You can, you can completely expand your life through social media. You can also contract your life mm-hmm. through social media and you can, you can feed whatever you want. If you have curiosity, you can feed it. If you have insecurity, mm-hmm. you can feed it. If you have a desire to get better, you can feed that. If you have, if you are in need of motivation, you can feed that. That's what Plenty of that around. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what social media it's, it's a tool that can feed whatever you want, yeah. whatever you're hungry for. Mm-hmm. So I just started using that better. And then things just, and then, yeah, I just, I just read voraciously in 2019, like every month, every day I was reading and yeah. it was just like gathering this knowledge and mind bending. It was all, I mean, it was mostly financial literacy, but it was all, all it was like personal development. Yeah. Um, well, what were some of what was some of the personal development books that you like? Uh, I would say the best one was um, Extreme Ownership. Okay, Jocko. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> where, did read... you, where, where did you find Jocko at? Um, some podcast probably, maybe Joe Rogan. Yeah, so Joe Rogan uh, and Tim Ferriss both had him on like pretty close to each other. And then yeah. he's, he's doing quite well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's really amazing. Like his yeah. whole that whole leadership mindset. Mm. And then um, I was also reading a lot of autobiographies or biographies. So I really love um, Walter Isaacson, who's a, who's an author of. Um, he did a biography on Steve Jobs. Which okay, it's great. He did one on Einstein. He did one on uh, Da Vinci. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, and Da Vinci is a really interesting guy. Like pure curiosity, like mm-hmm. curiosity for curiosity's sake, and that's why his attention to detail and like the musculature of the human body is so. Because he would um, he would uh, dissect cadavers, and he would spend a lot of time doing that. And uh, I would read um, a lot of Bruce Lee. Okay, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. Um, yeah, so so I would say I would say the best personal development book that I read was that Extreme Ownership book. Mm-hmm. So was... when when you read a book like that, I'd say there's a lot of people out there that read a lot of books and they're like, "Hey, I know all this information, but how did you start implementing that uh, into your life?" Yeah, and that that's what I started realizing this year is like 2019 was a year of knowledge. Let's say mm-hmm. 2020 was a year of action. Yeah. And so it was about taking all that and a little bit of luck, I think, with TikTok and blowing up and stuff like that. So yeah. then I realized, oh, the ownership mentality here, it's, it's at play right now. Like, mm-hmm. I own the creative process. Right. I don't own the platform. So the, the platform can always go away. Yeah. But I have found a way to own the process to then keep creating. Yeah. Okay. So let's do that. Then I started getting more popular. Now it's about, okay how do I maybe monetize this? Mm -hmm. So that's when I started creating the merch. There you go. And then getting into that game. Yeah. So who, who, sorry, on on the merch part was Mm -hmm. somebody saying, Hey, you need a Shopify account or a, or a threads or what, what was, what was the move on that? So I saw a TikTok. I distinctly remember this. I saw a TikTok. Somebody posted about like, Hey, here's how you create merch. You go, you go to um, Teespring open up an account, create a design and you sell. Great. So that's where I started. Mm-hmm. Teespring. Um, it's great for beginners. Yeah. But for me, I just knew I wanted to get more and more. I, I, efficiency is very important to me. So I want to do something, whatever it is 
to at, at a level where I feel like I'm being most efficient. Yes. And I'm doing it at a high level. Mm -hmm. I feel is, oh, this is the way like the pros would do. Yeah. So I started with Teespring and that was great. And I learned, oh, that I can sell merch. I can create merch. Mm -hmm. I can do it. Okay, cool. Then um, I got a little more popular and, and, and a really great artist reached out to me and was like, hey, I want to like help you design your next line of merch. Nice. Cool. So I, so I, I was like, okay, cool. Like, and she's really awesome. She like has her own brand. She has her own. So I yeah. was like, oh my God, it's cool. And then she introduced me to the whole like Shopify, Wix, mm -hmm. e-commerce store. And she, she introduced me to Printful, which is a third party yeah. service. Um, and she introduced me to that whole, I, I would call it the next level, like right. tier. It's, it's one up from Teespring in that now I get to create an email list. Mm -hmm. I get to see where the orders are at. I also have to do maybe some of the customer service and like figure all that out. Mm -hmm. But I, I have more oversight over the process of my customer's journey. Yeah. Because I know where they place, oh, this person placed the order. This is her name. This is her address. This is her email. This is her mm -hmm. The order is now being printed. The order is now being shipped. Blah, 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 blah. With Teespring, I can't do it. It's very, very bare minimum. Yeah. I can't do any of that. So Printful was the next level. Then I was like, I don't know. Like, this is cool. This is great. But is there another level? And then I started learning about, I started making friends on, on TikTok through the Layman Investor account. Mm -hmm. I came across um, Adrian Brambia, who's an amazing, like, he's a king of like affiliate marketing and online mm -hmm. business. And I was like, just picking his brain because he was really um, um, just a really nice guy. We bonded. He's a dancer. So we bonded on that. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, as in living out of his van yeah. currently. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. It was freaking amazing. And so so who contacted who on that? I think he DM'd me on Instagram and then we, we sort of DM'd and like connected and like, yeah. he's a really nice guy. And like, he's very um, transparent with just like his information and just mm -hmm. grounded and, and you can see it in his content. Like he's yeah. not a scammer. He's not, yeah. he, you know, so I just picked his brain about stuff. And That's awesome. He introduced me to some books um, by Russell Brunson. Okay. Russell Brunson uh, created the platform ClickFunnels. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started reading his books, learning about ClickFunnels, sales funnels. And that led me to ClickFunnels and then taking the One Funnel Away Challenge, which was also recommended to me by another friend who I made. Um, again, it's just like networking on social media. Like, yeah. You know, one person saying this and the other person's kind of piggybacking on it. And it's like, so I took that. Mm -hmm. And that, that was like a game changer. That's when I learned about the importance of email. Lists. That's when I learned about the importance of being, bringing more value. That's when I learned the importance of um, telling your story, mm -hmm. which I had already understood how to do because I'm an actor. So storytelling yeah. kind of lends it. And then I started realizing marketing and selling is not evil and it's not yucky. It's just that some people who do it are yucky. Yeah. Car it's the same thing. It. Yeah, it's the same people that like in the acting world, there's some actors that are just yucky, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, make, it doesn't make acting the profession inherently yucky. Yeah. It's the people who express and how they express. Mm -hmm. And if you get distracted by that, then you might create a wrong generalization about what they do. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see artists shoot themselves in the foot because what I see is all artists hate business. Okay. But if they combine the two together, they might actually be able to live and create and influence the people that they want to. Yeah. So this is where art and business come into play and come in, uh, come together. And what I realize about marketing and selling is that it's just story. It's just another medium of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so by me attacking th this skill set that I used to have judgment about and I used to hate yeah. and condemn. If I approach it from that lens of this is just storytelling. Now I can start learning about it. Mm -hmm. Now I get out of my own way. And now I can open myself up to actual useful knowledge from people that are actually 
have integrity and yeah, are yeah. making money and are influencing people's lives. So it, it, and what I realize is like, there's nothing wrong with marketing and selling and making a buck off of somebody. Yeah. If the value you're giving is up here and the price they're paying is down here. Right. Yeah. It's, it's when it's reversed. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. So, you're so, so yeah. So like, so now I'm just taking action and all this stuff mm -hmm. has helped a lot. So how do you manage all the things that you're doing in a day now, obviously, since what we have going right now in 2020, we can't do as much stuff, but how, yeah. do, how do you choose on what you're going to do in a day a week? You said you don't do too much planning. So what is that? Yeah. What does that look like for you? I, I, I fall into like rhythms. So I will say that like, again, it's that discipline. It's that mm -hmm. like childhood, like, Oh, it's Tuesday. You got to go to karate. It's Wednesday. Okay. You got to go to 10. So every day, no matter what, I will always make content on TikTok. Got it. And then I will always repurpose to Instagram. Mm -hmm. And then after that work is done, I will then, I'm either, now I'm working on like another sales funnel to launch the hoodie. Awesome. So, so now it's about creating digital assets around that. Mm -hmm. like, I'm, like I'm working on some audio files. I'm like writing a short story. Like it's again, it's like this yeah. other, it's like this other way of expressing myself. Mm -hmm through business and ownership because I own it. Yeah. Like I own the process of all of this. Yes. You know what I mean? Like I'm not for waiting sure. for somebody else. Yeah. So again, it's more of that practice of ownership, ownership, ownership. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. And then it will probably um, evolve. And then I'll probably like look to make another funnel around this great course, the one funnel away challenge. Mm -hmm. give people more value that's another thing i do affiliate marketing for because i think it's just such such a valuable course um and if people want to take it they can just go to the links in my bio on the mm -hmm. investor they can take the course um so that's that those are my those are my projects right now is 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 creating that mm -hmm. uh the funnels and uh creating like if you will side hustles right and then all the money that comes in, however little, however much it is, yeah, I can now use to pay my rent, food, mm -hmm. and then invest and jack up my investments. Mm -hmm. So as then, far as streams of income, are you shooting for like, hey, I want eight or nine, or it's I want just X amount of incomes that are coming in without me having to put more hours in every single week? Or what, is, yeah, what does I, that kind of look like? Yeah, it's interesting. I think the upfront work is a lot yeah. for sure because you have to kind of build and you have to invest the time to build a brand and then build all that stuff. Yeah. And then new skills and whatnot. So the idea is to is to just keep exploring this and mm -hmm. to keep um, as the money's coming in, put it into investments like my index funds, my crypto, and then eventually get into real estate investment properties. Yeah. That's, that's where the real passive income tax-free can really be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and then keep making content to then get brand deals. So that's another source of income. And yeah. that will then be fed into that. I think eventually, like, it would be to get um, these index fund portfolio to, like, I don't know. I don't really have an end goal in mind. To me, it's just about keep this process up. Yes. Yeah. it's there's no end there's like i don't really have a number per se mm -hmm. it's like a million dollars in the nest egg two million right it's really about keeping this system going 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 mm -hmm. giving myself more and more freedom and then right. i can and then i have the options to do oh, i want to donate oh, i want to yeah. invest in this person oh, i want to help a friend out yeah oh i want to go on vacation or whatever and, it's, and when... uh, oh, sorry oh. ultimately it's to get to a place where i no longer need where there's no longer pressure on my creative work mm -hmm. to fund everything else. Right. And so like when you say freedom, you mean making money, not by the hours you put in, but by the things that you've done. Yeah. So now the money is working for me. Mm -hmm. Making Wonderful. money work for you. Yeah. Um, so as far as doing all those things, 2019, what has your fitness and health looked like since all, all we've been doing all, all this stuff for, for a while. Yeah, it's, it's been pretty good. 2019 was good. Um, 
I started training in martial arts again, but this time in Bruce Lee's uh, Jeet Kune Do. Oh, I've actually never heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's really, uh, it's really great. Unfortunately, this year because of Corona, yeah, I couldn't really train as much. But, but that was a great discipline. And then I, in so I still dance a lot. So okay. that's, my, that's a big form of exercise. Yeah. Um, I do animal movements, okay. uh, animals, Flows. Uh, yep. animal flow. I started implementing that again. Super cool. This year. Um, so yeah, this year has been a lot of at home hit workouts and, yeah. um, and um, dance. And then I just went for like a five mile run today. Nice. For the first time. It was like blistering cold in LA. That is, but, yeah. But um, yeah. And then I think what I need to do is incorporate more stretching. Mm -hmm. as i get older that's that's i heard that's good for you yeah <laughs> the, the yoga was like helping me yeah but i can't really go to my yoga like i don't like stretching it's yeah you know, it's not like it. i'm i'm right there with you you know so but it but a yoga class forces you and you know I mean? yes for sure uh, but now that i don't have that i just got to do it at home mm -hmm. so the fitness has been good the diet's been good over the last few weeks mm -hmm. um uh, a lot of salad, a lot of like chicken. Um, I also have like acid reflux, so I can't. Uh, I Your body lets you know pretty early on. <laughs> yeah, I gotta be very careful. If I if I like, like I remember I slow cooked this leg of lamb. It was very. It, it became very good after a while. Yeah. But I cooked it with wine and like salt and all this stuff. And mm. that whole week, I just had like so much uh acidity and, and so mm -hmm. much just it was brutal but i also can't throw out food like i, I just can't do that you know what i mean like i i've put all this time effort and i'm looking for financial freedom here i can't be throwing out yeah, my food. yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and it lasted it lasted a week so it was a very good investment it was uh that meal costed me 70 dollars and it lasted or me a week 21 so meals uh, uh no let's say seven meals okay so that's 10 bucks a meal right yeah yeah it's not bad yeah for a tasty meal that's pretty good yeah and then we make uh, heroes and then yeah for sure so would you say your fitness and nutrition is more so habit based or do you have to force yourself day in and day out to kind of do these things yeah i think it's more habit based i i, mm -hmm. I see myself sometimes going through dips Mm -hmm. which is something is happening and like i am not like i'm, I'm like ex exercising demons out of me mm -hmm. if you will yeah and then i get back on track because for whatever reason i'm like yeah this has got to change so then i then i get into that mm -hmm. and then and then so it cycles um eventually what i would like to do is again this will be another investment is to get a proper trainer but also a nutritionist so I can get more scientific yeah, and much more specific to my body mm -hmm. uh, with fitness goals and nutrition goals that will then feed it yeah. so that I can, so that I can sustain my energy and my body as I get older, because I want right. to be able to move the way I'm moving now. I want to be able to move when I'm 50, 60, yeah. like, like Tom Cruise or like, you know, those guys. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, that, that's one of the main things I have this podcast on for is because most people, when they start looking at diets or start about look, losing weight, they're kind of hard headed in that direction. And then I'll have you on and then I'll say like, Hey, this is kind of what you do. And that's not based off of just like 90 days of effort. And then it's just your habits. Yeah. To me, it's lifelong commitments. Mm -hmm. My dad would always ask me like, he would, his huge thing was like, can you do this when you're 70? Mm -hmm. Can you do this when you're eight? Like yeah. whatever you're doing now, right. it's great. But can you do it when you're like 70? Mm -hmm. can you do it? So it's that kind of time frame, it's that long-term investment mm -hmm. time frame that I think of. These are long-term, lifelong commitments to yeah. um, relative health and fitness. Like I'm not a no, I'm not like athlete, like athlete fighting shape, mm -hmm. but uh, I would say like. If you, I you don't just went, if five I, miles, that's pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. But like, if I don't, um, yeah, like my whole mental game deteriorates when my physical game, when I can't work out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like being injured is not fun. For, like I had an injury, a shoulder injury, like a few years ago. 
Mm-hmm. Just those three, four months was just mentally, it was like horrible. Yeah, for sure. Because if I, if I can't move, it's very, it's very troubling for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My wife tells me to go work out in the garage if I'm ornery or something of that nature. <laughs> yeah, like, you yeah. out today? Ah, go yeah. work out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. If, if anybody was interested in finding you on social media or where, where would yeah. they find you? So, if you want to find the entertainment acting yeah. stuff, you can follow me on TikTok and Instagram at the real Rahul Rai. Okay. And if you want to find the investing stuff, financial literacy stuff, and the side hustle stuff, mm-hmm. um, you can find me on TikTok and Instagram at the layman investor. Wonderful. And uh, that's about it. Those are the those are the two main. That will have the rest of the stuff if they if yeah. they need it. So yeah, yeah, the 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 last two questions that everybody gets. Um, what's your definition of health? Not necessarily the dictionary definition, but what's something that you strive for um, just as far as health goes? Yeah, I think if you can just, if you can sweat every day, I think that would be very, very useful. Mm-hmm. Um, at least once a day, if you can find a time to like uh, get your heart rate up and sweat and work out, then it has very positive impacts on everything else you do. It, it's people like ask me like how I have so much energy. Cause I don't drink coffee. Yeah. I don't, I don't do Red Bull. I don't do monster. I don't do like energy drinks. They're mm-hmm. like, how do you have so much energy? And like, it's because I work out. Mm-hmm. How do you have nice skin? Uh, it's Cause I work, I, I don't do treatments. Like yeah. I don't do. And I, I never realized like I had good relative good skin until yeah. TikTok and people were like, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. TikTok has revealed a lot of things to me, but um, it's just, I think really the secret weapon is, is, is sweating and exfoliating your skin through sweat and mm-hmm. working out and then like a healthy amount of sleep. So again, if you want like, I don't know, that happiness that I think working out is going to be a very important, pivotal part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as what's something from your life that anybody listening to the podcast would be able to take away as a benefit for, uh, to theirs. Yeah, I, I would say like, I read this in uh, rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki and has always resonated with me. It's like, you might be one or two skills away from like completely, um, expanding and like realizing your potential. Mm-hmm. But what I would add to that is those one or two skills might be in realms of knowledge that you have a ton of judgment about and fear. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like the financial literacy stuff, the business stuff. And now I see the positive spillover effects. Mm -hmm. So if you have the self-awareness to understand like this skill is important for me to get and acquire and learn, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you tie in the discipline to just do it anyways, because you are scared because you are that it will do a lot. It will pay. I think it will pay you dividends in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. It was a lot of fun. Well, there we go. Damn. That was a quick hour and a half. That was solid. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. It goes by quickly. Yeah, no, I was, I, I went on another podcast. It was the same amount of time. But it just felt like really dragged out. Yeah. Oh, really slow. But this one was just like, whoa. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I would say my my background in uh, conversations would be I grew up spending time with my grandparents, and they yeah. all had very well rounded friends, and they all were extremely just well uh, earth travelers and stuff like that. So. I would just sit there and listen. And then as I got older and older, like I was allowed to join the conversation, but it it was mostly from that. And then a lot of the jobs I had, instead of working, I would just be talking to people Yeah, (laughs) because I was always so curious, but yeah, no, I just pretty much a majority of the questions I ask, it's because I'm interested. I'm not just trying to like lead you to a certain direction, but I just, I enjoy it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I had a great time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if you want, yeah, if you want to do this again, sometime sure. in the future, like six months, a year from now, whatever. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. So, how is the uh, the funnel and all that stuff going for you? It's good, man. Like the so like Teespring to Printful to funnels. Yeah. I've just seen if we're just talking purely money, we've mm-hmm. just 
been able to like basically double everything That's with great. the funnel using the funnels. So to me, like it's either you have a sales funnel or a website. Those mm -hmm. are like the two vehicles that you can sell your stuff through your either your product or somebody else's product. Yeah. In my personal experience selling merch across these different platforms, the funnel provides again the most bang for the buck. Right. To the customers, which then helps you as a business, which then allows you and you and I've been able to increase my profit margins actually because really yeah, so like I can now, so I sell a pillowcase and mm -hmm. I sell um, blankets. Okay. But it's part of this, I've created like this whole collection, mm -hmm. like this whole, it's called a boyfriend collection. Yeah. So it's like, it's got a theme, it's got a story. And then I've got digital products attached to it mm -hmm. to create more of that experience and the entertainment experience. Yeah. So I can sell a pillowcase for like 50 bucks. Yeah. Nice. And then I can add like a That's little a pretty bonus. good profit margin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm also paying for the, the cool thing is now because I'm able to charge that and get a and and be able to provide value at that level, yeah. I can actually pay your shipping now. Oh, everybody loves free shipping. So now you don't have to pay for shipping. Yeah. I'm I'm basically covering that. Yeah. But it yeah. doesn't eat into my margins to such a degree that I'm now just making a dollar. Right yeah so so i'm able to do that kind of stuff because i understand if you provide more value you can charge a slightly higher price mm -hmm. and the customer is still winning out at the end for sure and you get to tell your story and you get to give them more of an experience so yeah in that way the 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 uh the one funnel away challenge which is the course that i took to learn all this yeah is uh, to me it's been like the i call it my best investment of 2020 really because of because of all the the skills that I've learned and yeah and just the new perspective I have on marketing and selling and strategy. oh absolutely yeah my my uh, wife and I started TikTok at the same time so I actually do nutrition coaching um, yeah. and uh, we we hit ten thousand followers around the same time I think I'm around twenty six thousand she's at about half a million so oh nice are you, are <laughs> so, you guys both in nutrition no she does organizational actually. Um, okay. So she put her fir first course out, I think it was like two days ago, and we're working with um, Antonio. He's relatively new on TikTok. I think he worked with Gary Vee or something. I should probably background check that. Um, <laughs> but he's yeah. been very helpful just being able to put the automatic stuffs in place and saying, here, hey, here's your deadlines. This is exactly what to do. And like it's like you said, like we could have tried to figure this out and be like, hey, these random steps, or you take a class, you it's yeah. just or you it's hire so nice. Somebody. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's another thing that I've learned, like hire somebody that knows more than you. Yes, other than, absolutely. So you, can, you can expedite the time. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as the movement and stretching <laughs> stuff goes, uh, have you ever heard of Ido Portal? Oh yeah. I love him. Okay. So there's, if you are, if you, if you're not a huge big fan of stretching, um, I have a coach in uh, Boulder that uh, he was, one of Ido's students that they go and whatnot, they finally started opening up their gyms. And this was like two years ago. And I kept on bugging them like, Hey, like, can you guys do an online thing? But yeah. they were like crushing it in person. So they didn't need to do anything, but COVID hit and they're like, Hey, we're doing zoom training. I'm like, yes. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so Is yeah, it? the it's fantastic. Uh, do you have a link to it or something? Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can send it to you. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're, so they have a Vimeo account where there's like 50 different one hour lessons on there. And then oh. they also do a train heroic thing where they'll write you like an individual program and stuff. So it's super nice. Like I hate stretching, but like, so those animal flows, like they do a lot of that stuff, but then it'll also yeah. be like, Hey, here's your handstand practice. Here's yes. pull-ups and all those things. Like it's, I like it. So, so it's like structured. Yeah. So like, oh, I'll, awesome. let's see if i can that that's what i've actually been looking for yeah is like more of a structured class mm -hmm. where i can learn yeah movement. so it, it will be like this was i don't know how well that's going to show up so that's it will good. be like the day and then it will and have the workouts and then there's a video for oh, each nice. of the workouts and stuff so yeah all like the spinal ways and that stuff like that's a good that's a good crowd pleaser <laughs> Oh yeah. No, I would love that if you can send that to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a subscription I'm guessing. 
Yeah, so it's, so you get your coach and then you get the the Vimeo stuff as well. So if they do, I think it's like a six or eight week program because depending on where you're at, they'll give you a bunch of stuff just because these guys have been training for the last five, 10 yeah. years and they have yeah. too much knowledge. Like, no, you just need to stick with us. I'm like, fine, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah i'd love to see that yeah no it, it and like you said like stretching i'm like i would do like hot yoga and yoga and like my aunt does yoga and pilates and i'm just like ah like yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless unless yeah. i'm at the class it's not not gonna happen yeah i i gotta stretch more i'm having like lower back problems yeah so i, I just pulled a, a muscle it's like getting better but mm -hmm. it's a reminder to me for sure cool yeah and i'll 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 text you that and send you the link on there um but yeah awesome i will talk awesome. to you soon and this is fantastic yeah, dude. it was a pleasure meeting you my man yeah absolutely and how do you pronounce your name again uh raul raul wonderful and, and right. rye, rye like the bread okay Lesson. wonderful awesome all right Take have care. a great night bye you too